Welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining this um, today, this moment, this party that we're about to have. And it is part two in the continuation of our Midterms Explained series. The first part was so successful, where we interviewed the Democratic Party chairs of Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, Georgia, and of course, the great state of Help me out here, people. Who am I missing? Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, obviously. And now with part two, uh, we have five more incredible states in our Democratic Party chairs. And the purpose of this series, just to remind everyone, is to give you the who, what, when, where, and why of the midterms, the 2022 elections, and also what your marching orders are in order to make sure that we win. This is how to donate, where to donate, how to get involved, how to help organize, and how to be a, a part of making sure that we win. Uh, and also just learning about other states and what's going on in them, which I think is super fascinating. And so with us today is the chair of the party, the Demo, excuse me, the chair of the Democratic Party of Texas, Gilberto Hinojosa, who um, is already out stylishing me, I can tell from his office. Where, where do we find you today, Gilberto? In my law office in Brownsville, Texas. Brownsville, where is that? Brownsville, that's a uh... The tip of Texas, uh, as far south as you can get, it's the only county or city, county in the United States that borders Mexico and the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. Okay, cool. And is this where you, is this where the, is this where kind of the Democratic Party of Texas kind of lives and holds itself? Or is it, is it would you say it's the Democratic kind of capital of Texas? Or where would you say that is? Austin is where our main office is at. I live in Brownsville. Um, okay. My office, my staff is, is in, in Austin, Texas, which is in the heart of Texas. Brownsville is the southmost part of the of Texas. It's part of the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. It's the, um, uh, the probably the largest concentration of Mexican Americans um, in the south part of the state, but it does not have the largest number of Mexican Americans because I think Houston has more than than uh, than the Rio Grande Valley. We got about 1.5 million people here in the Rio Grande Valley. Amazing, amazing. Well let's just get right into it. Um, so we've done five of these conversations, like I said, and a lot of the states that we talked about talked you know with before were all considered to be purple in some way. Texas isn't normally seen as this purple, at least by a lot of standards. And so I guess I want you to help maybe check my expectations. You know, what do we get wrong about Texas and kind of its political makeup? And, and how would you characterize it on the kind of political spectrum between blue and red as it relates to other states? Well, certainly it, it, it is considered to be a battleground Texas. It's considered to be on the verge of turning blue. Um, if you look at the it, it's a huge state geographically and um, population wise. It's got uh, probably the largest Hispanic population in the country, the largest African American population in the country, probably close to the largest, if not the largest Asian American country, uh, population in the country. But it has a large um, population of, of Southern white folks that, you know, have lived here from, you know, 150 years or so. Um, it is uh, if you look at where we are today, um, about 70% of the people of the state of Texas, of the population of the state of Texas, live in counties that are run by Democrats. Uh, so all the big urban areas are run by de Democrats. Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, El Paso, South Texas, the Rio Grande Valley, um, the the big portions of the suburbs of, of Dallas, Fort Worth, and, um, and uh, Houston, Fort Bend County, Tom DeLay's old county, which is a huge, huge county, about uh, seventh largest county in the state of Texas, completely blue. Tarrant County, which is Fort Worth, is the only county that remains controlled by Republicans, but the last two election cycles, Dem Democrats have won it countywide for the U.S. Senate race and Joe Biden won that as well. Texas, in in the last election cycle, came within five points of flipping for Joe Biden. We hadn't gotten that close in forty years in a presidential wow. election. Uh, and can I just um, stop you there for a second, Chair? Why, why did that happen? Why? Why would what happen? 
why do you think the 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 state got the closest it's been in 40 years in the last election? What what was the cause of that? Well, I think a combination of factors. I mean, one, you know, we we are a majority minority state uh, even today, right? And we have been for quite some time. About 40% of the population in the state is Mexican American or Hispanic, but primarily Mexican American. Um, 15% of the population or over 15% of the population is either African American or Asian American. So that makes us a majority minority state. But we've been that for, um, uh, for about eight or 10 years. <clears throat> but I think what happened this election cycle that uh, got us to that point and got us closer than we've ever gotten before was a com combination of other things. One, the party is much more organized, much bigger today, much um, more sophisticated uh, than, than it's ever been. You know, if you look at the different functions that we provide as a party here in Texas compared to other states who are doing, you know, an outstanding job, we're, we're ranked as one of the top uh, states in the country in terms of an organization that does things like vote by mail applications, does, you know, uh, follows people that are coming into the state, registers them to vote. You know, we, we have a uh, huge uh, organization in, 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 in terms of uh, developing the data that we use to be able to track Democratic voters or Democratic leaning voters in the state. Our, our, our system is, is, is the model for democratic parties across the state of Texas. And I can go on and on in all the different functions that we provide. We, we have probably the most extensive um, communications messaging department in the country as well. <clears throat> and so that combined with the recognition by, by the Democratic National Committee and the National Democratic Organizations that Texas was a state that, that needed just a little bit more help to get us to where we needed to get to flip the state. There was a, a significant investment by uh, the National Party in Texas. They helped us um, in some of the House seats that we're targeting. We had nine seats to flip the House. We flipped eight of those seats, um, um, but then lost one that we had picked up in 2018. Uh, and But to all told, we barely, barely, uh, we met all our targets, but we weren't able to, to get the cigar. Mm -hmm on those seats, but there was a lot of a big, big investment by the National Party in that, those races and the U.S. Senate race that we had as well. And then even though he didn't invest anywhere near what was done in Florida and in some of the big battleground states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and, and Ohio at that point, there was a larger than normal investment by the Biden campaign in Texas. And, and then on top of all of that, you know, you know, I, I think that uh, Donald Trump, I think, uh, raise a level of enthusiasm. We, because of all those factors, we increased our turnout by thirty percent, which was wow, thirty percent, thirty percent in the president in the statewide election. We had, we we uh, we came only in second. We we, we were the we were the second largest increase um, in in uh, turnout of any state in the country. So all these factors combined together put us to where we were at before. The bad thing about it is that we needed to run to win the house, the house, um, and because we didn't win the house, Republicans uh, passed all these decronian, decronian, right. decronian measures that just you know were terrible. They, which, yeah. which we'll get to, we'll get to, Chair. Um, before we move on to kind of going down the line um, of of the races, I'm just going to let you know that I'm trying very hard not to put on my competitive California versus Texas hat. Because I see you, I see you using all these statistics about how Texas has more than and the most of and the biggest. And I'm just gonna not go there, but I'm telling you that I wanna go there, but I'm not gonna go there. Well, I'd because love to go there because it, it really <laughs> distinguishes Texas from California. And I think it's important that you do go there because it's a factor of, of I guess, um, evolution, right? Is the way I see it. See, see, what California had and has that Texas does not have was a strong labor slash civil rights movement that was uh, largely motivated by Mexican Americans, the, the farm worker movement. And what that did over a period of time, and, and that precipitated other labor movements like SCIU uh, and so forth, that what that did was it, it politicized and engaged the Mexican-American community in California. 
uh, uh, Proposition 187 obviously prompted a lot of this to occur. But because of that, what happened is that you were able to increase voter participation with Mexican Americans uh, significantly in your state. And, and, and then you combine that with the fact that the, the other uh, uh, minority populations like the Asian American population, which is probably huge, and the African American population, were particularly the African American population, they were already engaged and politicized based upon a civil rights movement that was completely, uh, its main goal was to engage people through political, to, 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 to getting them to go out and vote, right? Um, we don't have that in Texas. We have the African American population that has a, you know, 75 year history of a civil rights movement that was focused in getting them uh, their rights through the, vote, the, the, the ballot box. But the, this huge African Hispanic population that we have, have has never been engaged because we didn't have that labor movement here. We didn't have that civil rights movement here. The voter turnout among Mexican Americans is, is far below any other groups of people, although it has increased significantly in the last eight years or so. Um, but it, it, um, it, it has that disadvantage than what you have in California. And so you're a deep blue state because Mexican Americans in California vote like there's nobody's business, right? Yeah, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna leave this there here because you are the chair of the party and I'm, you're probably right. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say yes, please. And thank you. Why don't we move on to, but, but, but in honest, in honesty, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for teaching me that everyone listening that. Um, but I will tell is, you one thing that one oh of God. the additional reasons why we have moved closer to blue is because a lot of folks from California have moved into uh, Texas. I don't like that. I yeah, don't like they, that. They are moving into well, Texas and they're bringing their democratic values to we, Texas. And they're as voting much better. as I want Texas to turn blue, I want those Californians back even more. Let's go to the governor's race. So Governor Abbott is up for re-election. Yeah. What's the path to getting him out of office? You know, what would it mean to have a Democratic governor in Texas? Do you think Beto O'Rourke has a real shot? Yeah, look, I was I was there with when, when Beto ran in 2018, 2017, actually, he started. He started a campaign where his biggest crowds were at in bars in Beaumont, Texas, with 18 people there. It ended with rallies of 4,000 people. Uh, with with pop-ups, you know, during the early vote of a hundred people within you know an hour of of uh, of being him present in the in a, in an early voting site or two hundred people, that's where where it ended. Where he just had this enormous momentum, came within two hundred twenty-five thousand votes of beating a well-funded United States uh, Republican United States senator, whose last name was Cruz. And by the way, I think. Tom Cruise has more Hispanic blood in him, I think, than Ted Cruz does, right? Let's get that straight. Uh, but anyway, I digress, okay? Wow, y'all are, are rough in Texas. I've said that for a long time, and he's not very happy about that statement, but I really don't care. But anyway, um, he has started this campaign, Manny, with the 4,000 people rallies, and he's yeah. moved up from there. Okay, and so the there's a lot of enthusiasm for him. Yeah, um, oh yeah, people love him. And they don't love him for any other reason be, other than he is sincere. And, you know, when he wasn't running, he wasn't sitting in El Paso, Texas, sulking. He was getting out there and helping us at every stage of the game. You know, when, when the, the, the Democrats walked out of the Capitol, um, because they wanted to stop the voter suppression uh, legislation. My, by the way, my daughter, Gina Hinojosa, was one of the leaders of that. She's a state representative in Austin. Wow. He wasn't sitting around cheering them only. He went out there and raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for them. He, he, he was on the, uh, uh, holding rallies across the state of Texas to support them. And, and every, every issue that has come up, the issue with respect to the anti-abortion law that was passed by the Republican Party. He's been out there fighting on that issue as well and expressing the outrage that a lot of Democrats 
uh, have in this state on a, on a large scale across the state of Texas. And he's been that way all the time on every issue when the when the when the all the people were murdered at the Walmart in El Paso, he was there as well. And, and so that is he, is he the only one running, or is he? Is there a crowded primary? Is he? Is he the Democrat in the race? You know, kind of. What's the map look like? Well, he's got a primary. He's got you know several people running in that race, but I think that they're all long shots, and he he's he's he is the presumptive nominee. I think. Got it. And by the way, for folks tuning in, yes, I see your messages. Keep messaging me your questions uh, and things you want me to ask Chair Inohosa, and I will do my best to ask them. Let's move on to the congressional map um, because there are no Senate seats up, I don't believe. So what's going on with the redistricting map in Texas? We've been asking this across the country. Um, explain to us how that's looking, the congressional map with redistricting. Um, and are there any uh, competitive or flip flippable seats that you see coming up in this uh, 2022 year? What the Republican Party did in Texas because of what they have been seeing happening in Texas, was rather than try to increase the number of state house and uh, state Senate and congressional races, was they packed the, the, the seats that they did have and made them safe. The seats that were, that were close, that were competitive, they made them uncompetitive. I see. Uh, and, a, and as a result of that, they did not uh, expand their the map very much uh, in terms of uh, making more congressional districts uh, that were could have been uh, uh, Republican in Texas. Um, they they we had a huge increase in population in the state of Texas as a result of a lousy census that was performed by Donald Trump. We ended up with two additional congressional seats, even though we should have had three. Those two congressional seats occurred because 75% of the growth of the state of Texas was people of color. Out of that 75%, 95% were Mexican American. Um, only one of those two seats is a seat that probably will elect either a, a, a progressive or a person of color, likely a progressive, because Lloyd Doggett, who was a congressman in, in, in Austin, moved over to that seat um, and is going to run. He's, his, his politics are great. The other seat will probably go to a Republican because it was gerrymandered to be a Republican. The I only see. seat that remains competitive then is the 15th congressional seat in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, they, about it. And, and, and that's a seat that was held by Vicente Gonzalez, is held by Vicente Gonzalez. He moved over to a congressional seat where the congressman was retiring. And so that's an open seat for us. We've got a great slate of candidates running for the primary. And the Republican Party, it's a, it's a plus, you know, four or five uh, district as far as Trump voters are concerned. I don't know that what that means really, because that was an anomaly that we experienced here in South Texas, largely as a result of uh, the, some of the statements that were made during the campaign about getting rid of oil and gas, uh, uh, the industry in the state of Texas. And a big part of that population that lives in South Texas works and survives out of jobs in the oil and gas industry. And, and that hurt us uh, and the immigration issue to some extent, because we have something like 15 or 20,000 border patrol agents down in the Rio Grande Valley. So I think, I think that's a district that we're gonna be able to hold on to. You know, we're, we're gonna end up with a good candidate because all the ones, all the candidates that are, the main ones that are running for that are outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we're going to focus on that district. So I think at the end of the day, it's going to be hard to pick up any seats because they made it very difficult to do that. But I think that we will, we will end up where we were before uh, this election cycle. and We won't lose any seats. Got it. So just to make sure I understand this right, the, gerry the gerrymandering and the redistricting basically created two new seats. Uh, one will probably go to a Republican. One will go to a Democrat. It has made the existing seats more partisan, fewer pickups, and the 15th district in Texas is the one that's currently held by a Democrat, and we're going to do everything we can to keep it. That's Great. Right. Let's go Let's go to the state legislature, which honestly, the state ledge in Texas is what's, I think, brought gotten the most press and buzz, because your state legislature is actually relatively close to being able to be flipped, right? The state Senate, you only need to put three seats in the House, it's nine. Right. Let me know if I have that right. Tell us a little bit about the state legislature. Um, I know there was a lot of effort to try to flip it in the last election. It didn't materialize to the extent that you wanted it to. So what is the current makeup of the state legislature and what is your hope for 2022? The Democrats have 67 seats. They need eight to tie. 
Um, so uh, figure right now the Republicans have 75 plus the eight. So they have 83, we have 67. We would need eight to tie, nine to, to take over the legislature. The nine, the, and in 2018, we picked up 12 seats on gerry, Republican gerrymandered seats that had been Republican for quite some time. In 2020, we targeted those nine seats plus some other ones um, and uh, met all our targets, surpassed them by a lot. But the Republican Party in the last you know, month of the election poured in millions of dollars and were able to save those seats. I think we lost them by a total on all nine seats. Well, the eight seats plus an additional one that we lost by 20 thousand votes which was not whoa collectively so, all those seats you by, lost 20, by twenty thousand. by twenty thousand votes wow. these were seats wow. this was the second tier of gerrymandered seats that the in other words the, the harder group of gerrymandered right. seats for us to win um we were we were well funded uh the the national party stepped up uh on these and along with the allied groups and we had a great organization one of the things that hurt us, and you've heard this a lot of times, Manny, and it probably uh, was the main reason why we didn't pick up another one or two congressional seats and flip the House, is the Biden campaign at that time decided that based upon, you know, the, the perception out there that, you know, the Trump administration was irresponsible with respect to dealing with uh, COVID, that they were not going to be irresponsible, that they were going to not... Uh, uh, expose volunteers to the possibility of getting sick from COVID. I see. So they made a, they created a prohibition for any money coming from the national party or the national allied groups could not be used for in-person campaigning. In Texas- Do you think that was a mistake? Huh? Do you think that was a mistake? Well, it was a huge mistake uh, because the Republican party didn't play by that rule. They were doing in-person campaigning. We were doing uh, uh, campaigning by uh, phone banking, right? That was it. We were, we were not seeing the voters in person. And, and, and where that killed us was with Hispanic voters. You know, if you've ever worked on a campaign, my son was working on one of the congressional campaigns and he even complained to me about this, but I already knew that he said, dad, you cannot effectively communicate with Mexican-American voters by phone. you got to go see people in person. And so Why we didn't have the, we had a, well, because, you know, it, they're not used to the political process. They are new to the political process. They're intimidated by the political process. And it is not a main priority for them because they're trying to make a living and survive, right? And so unless you, you go see them and talk to them about the importance of this election, it's very difficult to make a convincing argument to them that they, it's important for their families to go vote on the phone. And, mm -hmm. and we had that as, now, you know, 2020 hindsight is everything. When we were right. running ah, this- Nice pun, nice pun there. Yeah, that's right. 2020 that's hindsight. Right. Exactly. I didn't even think about it. The, yeah. problem, the problem is that in 2020, when we were doing this campaign, we were doing polling, and all the polling is were polling was telling us we were going to still be able to flip those seats and and three or four other, right? As everybody knows, the polling went out the window in this election, uh, and and we did well to survive. We didn't lose any seats, unlike most other states in the country. Right. Nobody ended up picking up any seats or any legislatures in the Democratic side. But, but, and I will tell you, I'm not, you know, I, I've been in politics for 40 years. I was an elected official for 22 years and judge in, in different categories and, and ran campaigns as a, a county chair as well. And I had never run a campaign that we didn't have in-person campaigning on, never canvassing. And I complained to the national chair, who was a friend of mine, Tom Pettis, and I said, you know, Chairman, I, you know, I've never seen this happen before. This is troubling me. And his response was, we don't have a choice. This, this is directive directly from the National Party. And so we did what we marched and stepped the way the National Party made us march and step. And at that time, we understood re the reasoning for it because, you know, we didn't want to be seen as being irresponsible. But at the same time, we really tied one hand behind our backs and it affected our ability to win this election. I, I think if we had not, if we had not had that restriction, we probably would have flipped the house um, or at least come a lot closer.
I see. Well, we only have a few minutes left before we move on. Can Chair, since we started a few minutes late, could I get you a couple minutes after the hour? Is that all right? Yeah, I'm. I'm I, I thought we were supposed to be on at two thirty. Maybe I didn't get you. Oh, I, I apologize. Yeah. Um. So 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 it sounds like we. So it sounds like there were some issues with twenty twenty, but you're feeling confident about twenty twenty two with the state house and state senate, or how are you feeling about it now? No, no, <laughs> because those seats, those nine seats that we that we had targeted the second tier of gerrymandered seats that were supposed to stay Republican turned out not to be Republican. Um, and so, or as much as what they thought they were, they were because they got, they elected their people, right? But the margins were razor thin. So what the Republican party did was rather than create any new state house seats that they could take, they made, except for one, they made all these seats relatively safe. Um, I see. So, so great candidates running against them. And we've had these kinds of obstacles in front of us before, but it's going to be harder. And, you know, we, we, we recognize that we're going to put resources in it. We think we could pick up uh, maybe not a majority, but we can pick up a, a, a several seats uh, to get us much closer. And maybe we, we will p- pick up a majority. I mean, people are pretty disgusted with what Greg Abbott's been doing in this state. And I think that's reflecting upon uh, the Republican Party. And, you know, when they're out there making statements that the, the January 6, 2020 assault, uh, uh, 2021 assault on the Capitol was legitimate political discourse, that pretty much disgusts a lot of people, makes them want to gag and throw up because they know that if that's legitimate political discourse, then the assassination of Abraham Lincoln by a, uh, a, a conspiracy of Confederates uh, in Washington, D.C., with legitimate political discourse. I mean, this is absurd. And I think this is one of the things that that the Republican Party is doing itself in on. And I'm hoping people are listening and I'm hoping they will react to them um, in this election. So, you know, we're we're gonna work it as hard as we have ever worked it before. And we think, particularly with if, if Beto is the nominee, which it appears that he will be, we will be able to generate enough activity out there that we will be able right. to pick up a lot of these seats and hopefully you know if, if right. the wind blows the right direction we'll be able to pick up um yeah and maybe use sure. some of maybe use some of those giant crowds and all that energy to kind of filter down to uh the other races in these districts okay and in our last few minutes i want to ask you about you've already kind of touched on it dovetails well into it which is about uh what the republicans have done on voter suppression and specifically making it hard for people to register to vote or actually vote there's some questions in the chat um, about um, efforts to re-register non-English speaking residents as Republicans that are re- already registered as Democrats um, and, and kind of what, what, what's being done to kind of make it hard for people to vote, crazy absentee voting rules. And then how are how is the Democratic Party trying to register as many people to vote as possible? And then on top of all that, Chairman, um, how can people on this call and those who will be listening after this, how can they get involved and help? Let me just briefly talk about the suppression laws and and how they're affecting us right now as we speak. They made it more difficult to vote by mail. Uh, They were, they just, during the pandemic, when every, almost every state in the country was increasing vote by mail, they were making it hard for people to vote by mail. Um, And so uh, we mounted a huge campaign to do vote by mail and probably got 2 million applications out to voters across the state of Texas, you know, chased them and got a lot of people to vote by mail. But one of the things, and so what they did on that, it was say, they made it more difficult to vote by mail by increasing the, the, the type of, of, uh, of ID that you need to be able to get uh, to vote by mail. In other words, they said, if you were gonna vote by mail, your application has to state either your social security number or your driver's license on there, right? And, when you submit your vote by mail application, the, the election officials that has that receive that vote by mail application has to make sure that either the license, driver's license number or the social security number matches the number that's in their voter registration card. Well, if you're an elderly person and you registered to vote 30 years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you don't remember whether you put your driver's license or your voter registration, uh, your uh, uh, your your uh, social security number on that on that uh, uh, registration application, 
And if you put the wrong one because you didn't know, because you, you, you know, this is not something you've ever done before, they, re they reject them, these applications. When these applications came in about 10 days ago, half of them were being kicked out in the state of Texas. And wow. what's, wor what's worse, what's worse, what's worse is that the Republican Party Secretary of State, the, the Secretary of State, which is appointed by the Republican uh, governor, that Secretary of State had access to everybody's driver's license number in the state of Texas. All they needed to do, uh, all they needed to do was to merge their list with the Department of Public Safety, and a lot of these applications would be would have been approved. But that's not what they want to do. They want to make it more difficult for people to vote. The other thing that they did, we we we, we had this county clerk um, in Harris County who was the vice, one of the vice chairs of the Democratic Party, by the way. And he set up these 24-hour these, uh, polling places, 12-hour uh, polling places, increased them all over uh, uh, Harris County. And then he had drive-by voting, where people could just drive by and vote, vote, vote. The, the turnout in Harris County, which is you know the third largest county in the United States, was huge. And it made the difference in this election. They made all of that illegal. The Republican Party, no 24-hour voting, no drive-by voting. They put all sorts of restrictions on what some of the things that he did. So they made it more difficult for people to vote, particularly in a, in, during a, a pandemic where you don't want to get near large crowds. Um, you can't register online in Texas. You have to register in by submitting your voter registration cards. If you're registering people. You can't register more than a certain number of people and turn in their cards. You can't keep the, the information on the voter registration cards. I mean, I can go on and on these archaic yes. laws that they have passed to make it harder for people to vote. They do not want people to vote in Texas. Okay, so, so how, what do we do? Yeah. Voter registration. We, that is our number one priority this election cycle. If we, if we didn't win these districts by 20,000 votes, we're sure is going to help going to register a lot more than 20,000 people uh, this election cycle. We're looking at trying to register anywhere between 7,500 to a million people. And we're going to target a lot of these areas where there's large concentrations of Mexican Americans that are not registered to vote. Uh, South Texas is one of those areas. Um, we think that that is really the key to, to turning things around. Plus, you know, a robust organized campaign led by, you know, a, a, a charismatic uh, candidate like uh, uh, Beto O'Rourke. So if you all want to help contribute to the voter registration uh, a fund uh, of the Texas Democratic Party, um, it's online. And team, team, can you find that specifically the, the voter registration fund for the party and put that link in the chat while uh, Chair Inahosa finishes his remarks? Thank you. So, and we're going to be... Uh, We've already started. One of the things that the Secretary of State did recently, he said, well, we don't have enough vote. Uh, because of a shortage of paper, we don't have enough voter registration cards to give out to everybody. No way. Yeah, are you not kidding, kidding me? I, am I not thought Texas kidding. never ran out of anything. Y'all are so <laughs> great. We got everything. They have a shortage all of a sudden of uh, voter registration cards. And you so, are kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. And remember, you cannot re register to vote by, by online. So if there's no cards, no online, how do you register? So what we said was the heck with that. We're going to send out to all our county organizations over a million voter registration cards to get people to go out and vote. Um, I mean, that's just the first step. Great. We're raising money to do that right now. Great, um, great. And so we're just, you know, we're gonna we're we're gonna have innovative ways of registering to vote. We've looked at what uh, Georgia did. Uh, in the last five uh, years, you know, to increase their voter turnout. Stacey Abrams, that was one of the big things that she worked on, that her group is working closely with our organization to put together programs like, like relational uh, uh, voter registration campaigns, uh, uh, apartment voter registration campaigns, places like Houston, Dallas, uh, Fort Bend County have huge apartment complexes, large uh, population of people who could vote that are not registered to vote. We're working on those as well. And then just a traditional door-to-door -door campaign. So we're hoping um, uh, that we can increase that voter turnout. Remember, Beto only lost by 225,000 votes in 2018. Um, that was two and a half percentage points 
which is the closest election we've had in, in 30 or 40 years. Well, you know what, Chair Inahosa, this has been amazing. I feel like I learned so much. I want to talk to more people who run uh, parties in states like Texas. Um, I have a feeling you and I would get along super well. Uh, and I hope you'll come out to San Francisco sometime. I want to thank all of you for tuning in as well. And as well, we're going to be putting this on our podcast on YouTube. The, go ahead and look at the links in the chat. Um, we have volunteer links. We have links to mobilize. We have the link to donate to the Democratic Party. I am also going to very quickly put the link to learn more about becoming a sponsor of Manny's. You can become a sponsor for $36 to $360 a month. Some folks are signing up for $100 a month. We have 108 54, 360, uh, we are relying on our family of sponsors to allow us to keep doing this kind of programming. And we're gonna do a ton more, uh, which dovetails into why I'm not in the sparkly office like I usually are. I'm here at an undisclosed location with the team and we are spending today and tomorrow brainstorming all of the incredible programming that we're gonna bring to you for free or at very low cost over the next nine months of 2022. But to do that, we need your help and becoming a uh, Manny sponsor is exactly how you can do that. So go ahead and click the link in the chat. Support the Democratic Party of Texas. Support incredible leaders like Chair Inahosa. And Chair, I'll give you the final word before we say goodbye. Well, we are never going to stop fighting. We, we know uh, what the Republican Party uh, is trying to do. It's one of those kind of things when you tell people that you don't want to do something, they even want they want to do it even harder. And one of the things that they were trying to do to our folks is tell them we don't want you to vote. So people are now more pissed off than they've ever been in their lives, and they're going to get out there and vote like they're they, they've never vote, voted before. And I think you're going to see a huge increase in turnout, and we're going to get rid of these demagogues who like uh, Greg Abbott, who 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 think uh, that the only way that they can succeed is by preventing people from going out to vote. So we Amazing. appreciate the support of, by the way, a lot of money that we got in our last election came from California. And we appreciate the support that we've gotten from folks, Democrats all across the nation. Um, we raised about a million dollars in our virtual campaign, virtual convention last, last election cycle. A lot of it came from um, actors in, in Hollywood that were helping us raise money and we appreciate that support and every cent of it was spent to try to get democrats to go out and vote and we'll continue to do that so thank you so thank much you. everybody for your support thank you chair and uh we have north carolina new hampshire florida california and um north carolina new hampshire florida texas california all those are coming up thank you so much again and have a good day everyone and enjoy the sun wherever you are bye <laughs>